I'm going to teach you how to model, texture, and animate products in Blender like a pro. This is what everybody except you is doing to get paid with Blender. No more introduction, let's get into it. Today we're gonna model something which I would rather not name because I have a feeling I'm gonna catch a $300 million lawsuit if I do. The first reference that I'm going to need is a background image which I can trace with my geometry. I couldn't find a front view background image on Google, but when you open the official website of this product, you got a nice front view image right here. Don't scroll because if you scroll down, you get this animation of a chick wearing the glasses. But if you manage to freeze this, then we can just go print screen and crop this shit out. I made a new folder on my computer where I'm going to save all the images for this project. And this one is gonna be called front reference on Google we can find the perfect side view image of this product so we're gonna go right click save image as and we're going to name that side reference then I'm going to pull up pure ref and I'll just drag and drop a bunch of images from Google into this little window here if you don't have pure ref then just go to Google and type in pure ref click on download right here and do whatever you got to do to install this it ain't quantum physics you want to get as many pictures as possible from as many different angles as you can find and that's going to give you a great idea of how everything is put together and you won't miss anything over here we got right view left view back view we got a top view image right here which is also going to be very useful here's another picture which shows us a wider angle but I got enough images now to get me started so I'm gonna throw this on my second monitor but you can also put it up here over the outliner because you're probably not gonna need that and you can look at your reference images right there now I gotta load up my background images and here's how you do that press one on the number pad to go to front view then press shift a image reference find your front reference and load it up and I'm going to add a little bit of transparency to this image so it's easier to work with throw that in the background get rid of the default cube and then go to front view again shift a image reference and load up the side reference the reason that we're loading this from front view is so that we can and compare the two images and make sure that they have the same size right now the side view image is a lot smaller than the front view image but we're going to try to align these images so that they have the same size it doesn't have to be completely perfect but the closer you get the better once you have the matching size you can just rotate this by 90 degrees and throw it in the background so that when you go to side view you're looking at this image so now we got this front view image over here and we got this side view image over here we got all the references that we need for now in place we might need some more pictures from google later but now we can start modeling I'm going to start by going to front view. I'll press shift A mesh plane to add a new plane. Then in edit mode, I'm going to rotate by 90 degrees around the X axis. And back in front view, I'm going to pull this to the side a little bit like this. Select this face, press W, subdivide. If W doesn't work for you, which it might not because every time they update Blender, they fuck up the shortcuts. I don't know why. Instead, you can go to edge and click on subdivide here. Now we're going to use this geometry, which we just created to trace the background image. And notice how I'm trying to use as few polygons as possible. This is because if I have a whole lot of polygons it's going to be very difficult to trace this and keep it smooth you can do this but it makes it unnecessarily hard instead it's better to add a subdivision surface modifier use one or two levels of subdivision and now you still have very few polygons to work with but you can see that there's a smooth curve connecting them so having very few polygons here means we have very few control points which means it's very easy to define the rough shape of this object again if you use a whole bunch of polygons like this you got a whole lot of vertices to work with that everything's gonna look jagged you're gonna mess everything up so try to keep your polygons as low as possible and later we're gonna add some more so that we can start adding the details and whatever else we're gonna need on this object for now just move these vertices so that this shape matches with the reference and then over here we're gonna have to connect this with the other side so to do that give me a mirror modifier and keep in mind that the mirror modifier is only going to work if the origin point is in the middle of the world here this is why a minute ago I moved this plane in edit mode because when you move stuff in edit mode the origin doesn't move if you move this in object mode the origin is gonna move so if we would have placed our origin somewhere around here our mirror modifier wouldn't work properly if you want to change the position of the origin point or the point across which the mirror modifier is reflecting the geometry first place your 3d cursor in the middle of the world by pressing shift s cursor to world origin then select the object which you want to mirror go to object set origin origin to 3d cursor now your mirror modifier is going to work the way you want it to alternatively you don't have to use the origin as the point of reflection Instead, you can go to Shift A, empty, and add any of these invisible objects. And in the mirror modifier for this object, go to this little eyedropper thing, which lets you select the mirror object, click on the empty, and now you can very easily move this to just the mirror point. In any case, I'm going to place this at the world origin. The benefit here is that it's much easier to control this object than it is to move the origin point of an object. Now we're going to move this edge backwards a little bit. Make sure that the 3D cursor is at the world origin. Set the 3D cursor as the pivot point. Then take these two edges, extrude, right-click, X to scale on the X-axis, and zero to 
to scale this to zero. Now your geometry is going to connect in the middle, but only if the mirror modifier is placed above the subdivision surface modifier. Now we can use this geometry to get the right shape down here for the nose. And we're also going to adjust some of these vertices around the object just to make sure that they align with the reference properly. We're going to have to bend this glass, but to do that properly, we're going to have to use this image as a background reference. Right now, I don't have this saved to my computer. I only drag and dropped it into pure ref, but I can select this image, right click, save, export, selected images. And now I can save this image to my computer. After you click save, then you got to name it, click export. And now in Blender, you can go to top view, find a folder where this image is saved and you can just drag and drop that into your scene. We're going to place that at the world origin, rotate by 180 degrees around the Z axis. Let's get this mesh out of the way and flip this sideways so that we can check the width. Give me a little bit of transparency. And now we can compare it to the front view image. So we got to scale this up just a little bit. And now that should be okay. Bring this back. And from top view, now we can see how curved this is supposed to be. Before we start curving this, I want to first correct my geometry a little bit. You always want your faces to have approximately the same size and shape. Right now, these do not. They are all quads, which is not bad. But this face is way bigger than this one. This one is pretty long and thin. So we got to probably add a loop cut over here, a loop cut over here and down here. And then we got to go all around this mesh one more time to make sure that everything aligns with the background image properly. Now we got this under control a little bit better, which means we can apply the mirror modifier and that's going to allow us to start bending this. So to bend this, I'm going to select this middle edge loop, press this button to activate proportional editing. You can also toggle this with O and we're going to set the interpolation type to sphere. If you don't know about proportional editing and how it works, I don't want to go deep on that in this video, but I talk about all these specific methods like proportional editing and all this other shit that you probably never heard of if you're a beginner in the ebook. So go check that out. If you don't want to pay nothing, you can probably just Google it. Anyway, now when I move this, it's also going to pull the geometry around it and it's going to bend it in a certain way. So now I can go to top view. And if I move this forwards, you can see that it starts to change the shape and we can give it the same curve as this thing in the back here. You can change the area of influence by scrolling up or down. That's going to drastically affect the shape you get here. Something like this seems about right. Now disable your proportional editing. We're going to have to extrude this right click alt s and from top view we can use this alt s feature to add some thickness to this once we add some thickness we're going to delete the faces in the back you can easily do that by selecting one face in one corner then control shift right click on another face over here and it's going to select everything in between those faces go to x delete faces and now we got a little bit of thickness here again we're going to have to adjust some vertices make sure that when you make any adjustments you do them on both sides of the mesh at the same time because we don't have a mirror modifier anymore we're also going to have to make this side a lot thinner so we can do that by selecting this edge segment and we can slide that backwards with double G and then maybe slide it back forwards into the mesh again. And now from top, you're going to see this impacts the shape quite a bit. You can also do that with the next segment over here and play around with that a little bit until you get the right shape. Now let's go to side view with three, move this reference forwards a little bit if you have to. And now this is showing me that we have a lot of work to do when it comes to the curve from the side view here. But first of all, let's get rid of one side because we made some changes over here, but not here. I don't want to use a mirror modifier. So I'll just place a 3D cursor over here with shift S, select everything, duplicate with shift D, make the 3 3D cursor pivot point, then scale to minus one of the x axis, correct the normals, merge vertices by distance, and now we can get back to work. So we're gonna have to take some geometry like this, pull that backwards on the y axis a little bit, then deselect this and pull this a little bit further. This is gonna have to go forwards a little bit. Remember that we're modeling with this orange curve that you see over here, which turns black when you go to edit mode, not the vertices themselves, which you can see in edit mode. All this has to go backwards as well. And this edge segment is probably gonna have to be slid down with double G like this. Try to get as close as you can to this reference, but keep in mind that it's going to be kind of tricky to try to coordinate the top image with the side image. Right now it looks perfect on side view, but it looks pretty fucked up on top view. Nobody in the world knows why this happens. Luckily, I don't really care because I'm just doing this for the video. It doesn't have to be super accurate. If I was actually doing this for the client and not just for the video, then probably I would have to ask them to send me some more accurate dimensions and measurements and blueprints and all this. I wouldn't have to go digging around the internet to find some images. If you're just doing this for your portfolio, the most important thing in that case is that it looks good and it's definitely going to look good. Anyway, Anyway, we're going to continue to play around with this geometry a little bit to try to get a shape that works well. There's no right or wrong way to do this. You just have to play around with it until something kind of works out. I'm going to take this edge loop over here and push that backwards a little bit. This also means that I'm going to have to take this lower edge loop and I'll also have to pull that backwards a little bit, but I don't want to move this vertex backwards. So I'll place my 3D cursor on this point, then select this again. And while my 3D cursor is the pivot point up here, I can scale this segment down on the Y axis. That's going to pull all this geometry closer, but it's not going to mess up the position of this vertex. We're going to try to make sure that we don't get any of this zigzag shit like this. Remember that you can use your proportional editing to make smooth adjustments to this. The smooth fall off is usually the best one. And now you can easily move a vertex and also move the geometry around it, which is very useful for making adjustments to this shape. Once you're happy with the shape, more or less, again, get rid of one side and duplicate the other side, go to object shade smooth. You can add a few more
more levels of subdivision at this point and you can go up here to the viewport shading properties if you're in studio and switch to matcap use this shiny one here this is gonna let you very easily detect any imperfections or dents in this surface for example if this vertex gets out of line it's very easy to tell by the reflections of this matcap whether there's anything wrong here on a less shiny matcap it's almost impossible to detect this now the hardest part is over because we defined the shape of the entire object with this surface here. So everything else is basically going to be extruded out of this and we don't have to worry too much about the shape or the curvature of anything else. So in the next chapter, we're going to model this segment behind the glass. This is the part where you got all the details and all the electronics and whatever else you need here. I have no idea how to name this chapter. The good news is that we can use the geometry from this glass shape which we just made to create this segment that goes around it where it's attached to all this other shit that gets on your face, right? So I'm going to select this edge loop and with P I'm going to separate that to a new object and then from top view we can extrude this and try to align it with the reference. It's supposed to be a little bit thicker on the sides so we're going to push it more backwards on the sides and keep in mind that the geometry at the top is going to have a very different shape from the geometry at the bottom. So first let's try to align the top geometry. We're first going to move this segment and we're going to deselect some vertices from the side we're going to push the inner segment a little bit further deselect some more geometry and continue to do that until you get the right shape we're going to look at pref to see what this underside is supposed to be shaped like i'm going to place my 3d cursor over here and select this entire segment scale it down a little bit on the y-axis move these vertices a little bit further backwards and something like this will do it once we got that we're going to have to slightly inflate this to make it more round as you can see it can't be a perfectly straight line it has to be a little bit curved on the edges here so i'm going to add two loop cuts take the loop cut all the way in the back and with with alt s we're going to deflate that then do the same thing on the next edge loop maybe slide it forwards a little bit use alt s to adjust it and do that with all the segments until it matches the shape over here now we talked about how we need all the faces to have approximately the same size approximately the same shape and all this right now we don't have that and just to quickly demonstrate to you why this is a problem imagine you have to make a circular hole here but it has to be only about this small using my method i would have to select these two faces inset them check edge rail bring these edges closer together and now i can turn this into a circle and use that as a whole as you can see that's a complete mess there's no way that's going to work instead we would have to add some loop cuts over here a couple of loop cuts over here maybe even some more loop cuts like this now we have some geometry which better allows us to inset this and turn it into a little circle and now this is more optimal for making holes the problem is if we just add loop cuts around this geometry it gets a bit blocky and it just looks like shit so one way that you can approach this is to subdivide all of this then select all the new edge loops which go all the way around this shape x dissolve edges and maybe you can do this one more time dissolve the edge loops again now you have square tiles and to prevent all this blockiness you can take these edge loops which go all the way around the shape go to w loop tools relax and set the interpolation to linear number of iterations to something like five this will make everything smooth but you might get some problems with this because the new geometry that we added to this mesh reshapes the surface so it might not match perfectly with the glass so alternatively you can apply one or two levels of subdivision surface then select every other edge loop on this shape once you select all of them go to x dissolve edges you can do that one more time now you have square tiles so if you want to you can subdivide this again or do whatever you gotta do make sure that these two surfaces have a matching number of subdivisions that's the only way you can ensure that this seam right here is going to be a perfect match with this shape once we got that out of the way i'm going to select this edge loop extrude right click alt s and that gives me a tiny little bevel here and to make that even smaller i'm going to select this edge loop Control b to bevel it i only want a very small bevel here give me two segments shape one and i'll do something similar on the glass part here so i'll extrude this right click alt s to push it inwards a little bit and give me a little bevel here with the same properties now this little gap here looks very clean and it's even around the entire shape at the back of this segment, we're also gonna have to make this little part here. So again, take the inner edge loop, extrude right click Alt S, maybe push it forwards a little bit. We want it to be shaped kind of like this. Then again, extrude right click and push it backwards on the Y axis. You can adjust this shape with Alt S. I also want to bevel this little edge here. Take the end, extrude right click Alt S to push it inwards and then extrude it one more time and push it further forwards on the Y axis. Take these two edge loops and bevel them with Control B. Now we got this little segment here which separates this metal part from the fabric, which is the part that it gets on your face it might even be a good idea to take this little segment and separate it to new object that way if i want to subdivide this even further i don't have to mess up this inner shape so i'll move over to the inside of this thing take this edge loop and do Control plus to expand the selection in wireframe i can see the border of the selection i'm going to make sure i select this entire part down to the bottom of this bevel p to separate that to new object and now this is a new object but the geometry is still matched on the inside here 
So now let's move on to the details. First of all, we got to have a little discussion. We got to make a list of the details that we have to make here. At the top, we have a button right here, two holes. I don't know what those do. And on the other side, it's almost like there's a volume knob or something. You can see that in this reference over here. Then on the underside, we have a bunch of these smaller holes. I guess this is like an exhaust or something. We have one, two, three very tiny holes here. Then we have this little camera on both sides and another tiny hole over here, but no two holes on the inside. This metal thing is not a part of the headset. It's just something they placed it on for the exhibition. You can also see from top view that we got some grills inside here. Now these holes here I'm going to make with a normal map and textures the same way I made the holes on the controller in the previous video. But all this other shit we're actually going to have to model. So let's start with the larger details which are on top of this headset. First of all I'm going to duplicate this in case we fuck something up. Then from top view I noticed that my shape doesn't perfectly align with this but I don't care it looks good we're going to leave it as it is. And this big hole is going to be approximately from over here until down here. The best way to do this is to select the geometry which is around this shape. Inset that geometry. Now you can delete the faces and just like that we got a nice cut here. I can also see that this back part is a lot wider than this part. I want it all to have approximately the same width so we're gonna have to do something about that. One way to control this shape here is to use our loop tools curve. If you don't got loop tools active go to edit preferences, add-ons, type in loop and activate this add-on called loop tools right here. Now we first need to make sure that these two edges are the same length. So we're going to duplicate this one and bring it back here. You can see that this edge is a little bit longer. So we have to slide it inwards a little bit like this. Duplicate this again and place it over here on the next edge. Slide this edge inwards and we're going to get over here to the other side and make sure one of these edges is also the same length. So for example, this one right here, we can adjust. Then take the vertices at the ends of the edges, which we equalize with the sides. So that'll be these two vertices. Go to loop tools curve and as you can see this changes the shape of this curve here do the same thing on the other side of this shape so let's do it one more time slowly we take this edge and we duplicate it and bring it to the other side because we want to make sure that these two edges have the same length now take the duplicated edge and place it somewhere over here on the next edge and also duplicate this and bring it to any of these other edges make sure that that also has the same length now take the vertices at the ends of the edges which we just measured so that'll be this one over there and this one over here go to loop tools curve you might have to adjust the interpolation check for both both cubic and linear see which one gives you a better result in my case cubic works and you can check the difference by reducing the influence or cranking it back up now the width of this shape is much more equal and you can check that by taking these two edges from the end duplicating them and placing them on any other point you're going to notice that the width is almost exactly the same on every part take the geometry from the ends and again adjust it to get a better curve here at the ends you can slide this outwards a little bit and slide these inwards a little bit that makes it look like a semicircle this side is a little bit different so you can reshape that accordingly and as you can see this gives us a pretty good result so we we can take this extrude right click and push it downwards you can go to face grid fill set the span to two adjust the offset and now you're gonna have a clean filling here then you can select all these sharp edges and add a bevel to them with two segments in a shape of one that's going to make this look sharper on the inside of these holes we got some grills and notice how their direction kind of aligns with the curvature of this hole here so to get that we're going to add a new plane in the middle of this hole and edit mode press x collapse edges and faces to turn this into single vertex add a subdivision surface modifier with control 2 or control 3 or whatever then extrude this to one side extrude it to the other side and try to shape this curve so that it follows this hole here something like this does it for me apply the subdivision surface modifier go to object convert to curve we're going to place the origin of that curve at the beginning so snap the 3d cursor over here object set origin origin to 3d cursor now snap that shit to the middle of the world and we have to create the grills so move this forwards a little bit add a small plane like this lower this edge extrude to give it some thickness you can delete the faces on the sides because they're not going to be visible you can bevel these edges if you want to to improve the shading go to object shade smooth if you want to go crazy you can add another bevel to these corners just make sure that the shape is 0.5 and not one now with an array modifier you can stack this in any direction my direction is going to be minus one on the x-axis i want my count to be something like this to match the length collapse the array modifier add a curve modifier target this curve with the eyedropper and if you move this along the x-axis it's going to follow the curvature of this curve that we just created you can scale down the geometry to change the size of the grills you can also change the factor to bring them closer together or further apart once we got the entire length covered we're going to apply the array modifier apply the curve modifier place the 3d cursor over here and with shift s we're going to snap the selection to the 3d cursor as you can see now the origin point snaps to here but the origin point is quite far from the geometry so we're going to select this little shape right here shift s cursor is selected and an object will go to object set origin origin to the 3d cursor now if we place a 3d cursor over here again we can snap it over there scale it down a little bit rotate it to make it align a little bit better and just lower it down 
into the mesh. Some of the ends are sticking out over here, so I have to select all the edge loops on the side like this. And once you got them all, you can slide them with double G. This one is still sticking out a little bit, so we're just going to lower them further down. You can also make this hole deeper by just pushing everything down. I think that looks pretty cool, but I'm going to delete this last one because it looks out of place. Maybe I'll take some geometry from over here, duplicate that and separate it to a new object. Fill this, loop cut this, join this. Take these two edge loops and extrude them like this. Lower this down. I just want to make an extra little platform here so this doesn't look so deep and stupid. We can select each one of these grills with individual origins. I'm going to rotate them around the x-axis and this just places them a little bit better. I think that looks pretty cute. While they're all selected, I'm also going to press P, separate by loose parts, lift all this up, go to object, set origin, origin to geometry. Now I'm going to select this last one and proportional editing set to sharp. I'm going to pull this down to give it some curvature and that way it's going to fit a little bit better into this hole. We're going to parent this to this outer shape with control P. That way if we want to move this, this is also going to move along with it. That's one of these holes done, but we have to mirror this to the other side. So from top view, we're going to delete this entire half. 3D cursor over here, select everything. Shift D, right click, S, X, minus one. Shift N to correct the normals. Select everything, merge by distance. Do the same thing for these grills because they're a separate object. Next, we're going to move on to these other two buttons, which is basically the same shit as these grills, but I'm getting sick of modeling. So I'm going to take a break. That's how I'm going to put this in the next chapter. First, we got a simple button on the left side over here, and then we got some kind of knob over here on the other side. These are pretty simple. We just got to cut some holes, use the outline of the holes to make the shape for the button. Then on the underside is where we got some finer details. First of all, we got these little holes over here on each side, and I'm not going to model this. I'm going to make this with a normal map and with textures. So we're going to say that for another chapter where we're going to be making normal maps and the textures. But we are going to have to model these little holes over here, and we're also going to have to model the camera. So we're going to have to cut a hole for the camera, model the camera on the inside and then cover this with a little piece of glass. So let's start cutting some holes. Now I almost lost my mind last night trying to cut some holes in here my way, which is usually insetting or using shrink wrap to define a shape. None of that shit's gonna work. We gotta go guerrilla warfare. So I just had to watch one Thomas Cole in 3D tutorial and all of a sudden I got a good idea. When we look at it from top view, we can see that a button is supposed to be placed around here somewhere. Now I know it's not perfectly aligned with the reference, but it doesn't matter. I can still see approximately where this is supposed to be placed. So I'm going to start by adding a plane, scaling the plane down. Down, and I'm gonna scale it up a little bit on the x-axis to make it a bit longer. We're gonna press B to bevel, V to only bevel the vertices, and then press C to enable clamp overlap. That way the bevels aren't just going to go through each other like this. Then you gotta scroll up to add some more vertices to these bevels, then select everything and merge by distance because otherwise you're gonna have double vertices over here. Maybe add a couple loop cuts here and here just to keep your geometry consistent. And then we're going to rotate this shape to put it in place, but now we have to align its rotation with the surface below. So to do that, turn on this magnet shit up here, change the snap method from increment to face project, check align rotation to target, and also check project individual elements. Now when you move this face with G, it's going to take the rotation of the normal line of the surface below it, okay? So it's kind of like if you take a little magnet which is meant to be placed on a flat surface like on a fridge or something, and you put that on a curved surface. You can see that when you look at this from different angles, it's always taking the angle below, but it stays flat, it doesn't conform to the shape of the surface like it would if you used a shrink wrap modifier. So we're gonna place that around here somewhere, and then we're gonna extrude this upwards, extrude the lower face downwards. Now we got a shape which we can use to cut the hole with a boolean modifier. So select the surface below, add a boolean modifier, set that to difference and target this little object here. Place the boolean above the subdivision surface modifier. And before we apply it, let's just duplicate this in place as somewhere in the back in case we fuck something up. Now apply the boolean, get rid of this face here on the inside. And now we just got to do some topology cleanup right here. Right now we have a mix of vertices which come from the shape which we just used to cut this out. And also vertices which belong to the surrounding geometry and the surface below. So we're going to try to figure out which vertices belong to this shape which we cut out because we don't want to change those. That's going to change the shape of the hole. But for example, this here is a straight edge and these vertices belong to the surrounding geometry. So we can slide these vertices to the corners here and that's not going to change the shape of the hole here. So we're just going to slide these vertices around as much as possible to try to connect this a little bit better. We might have to just dissolve some vertices like here because we have nowhere to slide them. And the problem is that we don't have enough surrounding geometry to connect it to every single vertex. Now, this is not going to be perfect topology. Like I said, we're getting barbaric today because I don't feel like dealing with clean topology right now. I'm not in the mood for that shit. 
Right now, I'm just trying to get a good result. I don't got nothing to prove. I proved myself in the last couple of videos. And if you want to see good topology, then go watch Thomas. Anyway, we're going to keep on sliding this around. We're going to try to connect everything as much as possible. We might have to do some triangles. We might even have to join some vertices to make a new edge to connect them. I don't want to add any loop cuts like this because that's going to mess up the shape over here and it might give me some shading artifacts. And before you know it, we got a nice clean hole over here with minimal shading artifacts. We got a little bit of shit going on down here, but I think we're going to get over it once we add some more levels of subdivision surface. If you you're following along and if you get some big mess like this then try to select the vertex and use alt s to inflate it or push it inwards or push it outwards or whatever and you're going to be able to clean up most of your problems and make them look reasonable now take this edge loop fill extrude inwards delete the face at the bottom and then select the outer edge loop here one more time Control b to bevel it we want a very tiny bevel with two segments a shape of one and we're going to uncheck loop slide to keep all the geometry even on this bevel now this shiny matcap over here is going to show me that i have some visible imperfections over here as you can see the light bends in a weird way when there's something wrong even though this probably isn't going to be visible in most shots if you're doing some close-ups right here it might be visible it might completely ruin the impression that you're making with this so i'm gonna do a little bit more work over here trying to inflate and deflate these vertices to make this a little bit more straight i'll try to connect some things a bit more differently and eventually things are gonna get a bit cleaner and they're gonna work out just fine once you got this ready then take this outline of this hole here p to separate it to new object by selection then select this new edge loop go to face grid fill adjust just a span on the offset until you get a combination that works well. Then just extrude this outwards a little bit. Control I to invert the selection and extrude the rest inwards. Delete the surface at the bottom because we don't need it. We can select all the edges around this. Control B to bevel them. Object, shade smooth and we're good to go. Then we gotta move over here to the other side. And this is where we have to make a circular hole like this. Now you guys always try to lecture me in the comments about how I gotta use loop tools circle to make these types of holes. Well watch what happens when I do that. You take a surface, loop tools circle. Then you're going to tell me you got to uncheck flatten. I don't think that's the result you're trying to get here. No, but are you? You got to check radius. There is no way in hell that loop tools are going to save you when it comes to making holes on curved surfaces like this. So we got to do this my way. And my way is unfortunately going to be another Boolean modifier. So over here, we're going to add a new cylinder. Let's do something like 24 vertices. Scale this down. We can even manually rotate this into place. It's got to be a lot bigger than this. It has to be something like this. We're going to try to get it so that the edges of the cylinder are approximately equally as dense as the geometry on the surface below. We're also going to try to make sure that this cylinder is not clipping through anything else on the inside here because that's going to give us some problems now let's just do another boolean target the cylinder place it above the subdivision apply delete the cylinder delete the face on the inside and then we just got to slide all this shit around a little bit to clean up the topology once we clean this up we're once again going to take this geometry fill extrude it inwards get rid of the face at the bottom bevel this edge loop right here and we kind of messed up because we should have kept the cylinder that we used to cut this hole but we can also just use the outline here to make the new button so p to separate this to new object f to fill then use loop tools flatten to turn this into a flat surface. Alt S, we can push it outwards. Then extrude it back inwards. Delete the surface at the bottom. This is more or less the shape for the button. The problem is that this button has some tiny details over here. It has some little lines cut out so that you can grip it if you're trying to turn it, right? It just can't be smooth because if it was smooth, it would get greasy and then you're not turning shit. So give me Shift 7 on the number pad to align my view with this surface. Shift S to snap the cursor to this surface. Shift A to give me a new circle. Let's do 128 vertices. Align it with my view. Scale this down fill extrude downwards inset this bevel this face over here shape 0.5 and we're going to use two of these little segments to make one of these little lines here so to do that just inset these couple of faces over here slide these two down and slide these two up to make this a little bit more curved on the ends take this extrude right click alt s to push it inwards control b to bevel these two edge loops because this is going to be subdivided with a subdivision surface modifier and i know this is crazy high poly but i don't care i'm just trying to get a good render then we're going to mark two seams around this little hole like this align my view with this face again with shift 7 place the 3d cursor on this face which is exactly in the middle of this then with l and face select mode we're going to select this little segment Control i to invert the selection x delete all the other faces except this now we had 128 vertices in this circle which means this since it consists of two edges is 1 64th of the full circle so you can do alt e spin use duplicates number of steps has to be 64 and then these together form a full circle now just merge vertices by distance fill this correct the normals object shade smooth i'm gonna do one level of subdivision surface as well extrude the inner part a little bit like this and that's gonna be our little knob right here i feel like mine is probably way bigger than it should be but who cares this is my vision 
And then we gotta move down to the underside of this vision thing. And we have to model the cameras and these two tiny little holes here. Since this is the same shit on both sides, we really just gotta do one and we can just copy it to the other side. So I'm just gonna focus somewhere on this part approximately. And this is where we're going to place the camera. So I'm gonna inset a surface like this. Make sure the edge rail is checked. It's gonna be a lot more even if you check that. We got 22 edges over here. So give me a circle with 20 vertices, scale it down. Give me two loop cuts like this, which are gonna allow me to take this and push it outwards a little bit. And then just cut this again. Then once again, I'm gonna use this magnet thing up here to paste this onto the surface. In wireframe, we can see the area which we designated for this. Rotate the shape into place. And then we're gonna use a shrink wrap modifier, project, target the surface below. That looks pretty good, so we're gonna apply. Join these two together. Delete this surface. Select the two edge loops, bridge edge loops. This looks like a big mess, but maybe when we extrude this, delete this, correct the normals and bevel this, it might look a little bit better. We're gonna take this edge loop and dissolve it. We got a couple of artifacts going on over here, but maybe we can adjust this geometry a little bit to get rid of that. And as always, I was right. That was a very easy way to fix the artifacts. Now we got a camera hole, and now we're going to model this little camera in here as well. So let's get rid of all our geometry inside the hole. Fill this, inset, delete the face in the middle. Give me a loop cut and push it outwards like this, then use Alt S to deflate this a little bit to push it inwards. We're gonna get rid of the subdivision surface modifier so it's easier to see what we're doing. Maybe we can even go to flat shading. This is the little step onto which we're going to fit the glass which is on top of the camera. Then we're going to fill, extrude inwards, loop tools flatten, inset like this, slide this inwards, merge by distance. And now we gotta figure out a way to make a camera in here. I'm gonna go shift seven to align my view with this surface. Shift A, give me a cube, align it with my view, scale it down, give me three levels of subdivision surface apply that add a cast modifier set the factor to one apply that select one vertex in the back exactly in the middle then give me control plus to expand the selection all the way to the edge here and we're deleting exactly one half of this cube now we're going to select the remaining geometry and scale it down to the local z-axis to make it more flat and that makes it look more like a camera lens i'm also going to use some of this geometry extruded outwards this is because i want some extra details around this lens and just to be cool we're going to inset this as far as we can add a bunch of loop cuts like this bevel them to turn them into two loop cuts then extrude select all the newly extruded surfaces like this deselect the edge loops around them now we got some edges selected like this go to individual origins scale to zero merge by distance and then we're going to select all these loop cuts mark sharp give me a crease to prevent the subdivision surface modifier from making this soft bevel these edge loops over here two segments shape one object shade auto smooth and when we go back to subdivision surface this is going to look absolutely beautiful once we got the little camera thing going on in here we're going to use this geometry from the surface separate that to new object and we're going to make the glass cover from that so give me face grid fill adjust the span on the offset until we got something decent i think this looks quite decent maybe we just have to fix the curvature so to fix the curvature select this alt s to inflate it then deselect the outer faces alt s to inflate a little bit further and maybe one more time on the edges in the middle you can do this a couple of times until the curvature looks about right but be careful because you might just make it worse anyway i think this looks pretty good so we're going to extrude this to give it a little bit of thickness select a sharp edge loop shift g similar face angles then bevel that with control b now object shade smooth and when we add a glass material to this it's gonna look lovely so we gotta copy this to the other side here the problem is we can't just delete one half and copy everything because this part is asymmetrical up here. So if we're going to delete anything so that we can mirror the other side, we got to do it only on the lower side. So we're going to select the portion which is in between the z-axis and the x-axis. We can do that by box selecting from over here. Select everything up to this point and up to this point on the x-axis. Make sure you don't select nothing extra over here which you don't want to delete. Then delete vertices. Place a 3D cursor over here somewhere. Select everything on the other side below the x-axis. Hopefully it's going to be the same thing. So shift D. Right click S, X, minus one. We missed an edge loop, but that's fine because we can just select these two W bridge edge loops and we're good to go. Shift N to correct the normals, M to merge by distance, and we need to copy this thing separately. Now we just need to make these little holes over here. To do that, I'm going to select four faces over here and make an octagon, slide the edges a little bit closer, loop tools, circle, uncheck flatten, maybe adjust the angle if you have to. And now we can just extrude this inwards like this. It looks like there's a little gap between the bottom of this hole and the sides. So so since I'm already getting into crazy details, let's do that as well. We're going to take this surface at the bottom, slightly inset it, then extrude this edge further inwards. You can do mean crease on the inside, but we're going to bevel these edges. We should have done this all together because now it's going to be hard to get the right size, but we're going to eyeball it and we'll be okay. And once we made the same shit three times, 
we're just gonna have to copy this one hole to the other side as well so to do that i'm gonna place a 3d cursor in the middle this little hole only takes up these couple of faces over here so we're gonna delete the same few faces on the other side select the vertex in the middle control plus to expand the selection shift d right click s x minus one correct the normals merge by distance and we're good to go that's all the modeling that we had to do for the visor so for the glass part for the actual electronics now we gotta move on to the back part like i said these holes over here we're gonna do those later as normal maps because we're gonna do that at the same time in the same chapter when we're gonna do all the other normal maps so for now we're gonna move on to this part over here and all this other shit in the back which you wrap around your head and whatever now the rest of this headset should be pretty simple. First we're gonna model this part that goes around your eyes and then we're gonna add this plastic shit and the headband in the back. So to make this part that goes on your eyes, we're just going to use some one of these edge loops over here. I'll duplicate these vertices and separate them to new object. And by the way, when you're separating just edges, you don't have to duplicate them. You can just separate them and they're going to be duplicated automatically. Then extrude this backwards like this. We're gonna scale it up on the Y axis to increase the curvature. I'm gonna use my shear tool to change the shape because I want to push the lower part further inwards but i want this to come out a little bit more i'm gonna use proportional editing to push the nose inwards further we're gonna have to scale this up on the z-axis like this and then we got this gray area in the back here but not all the way around because that's cut off by this black part on the middle on the nose part over here so we are gonna extrude this a little bit further out and then we can extrude everything alt s to deflate it and now we have some extra face loops around here which we can use to make this but we're gonna have to cut that shit off somewhere around here so somewhere around the middle we're gonna take an edge loop and slide it a little bit inwards like this then we're going to select these two edge loops which go all the way around here these select everything on the inside of this edge which we just slid inwards a little bit we should probably use a mirror modifier for this so deselect everything after this part over here and select also these two edges here so now we can bevel this with Control b if we add three segments we get an extra little edge loop on the inside here which with alt s we can just deflate and that's going to make it look like there's a little edge or a gap here but it ends around here somewhere we gotta deflate this quite a bit maybe give me some extra geometry Geometry over here so we can tighten this up a little bit i'm gonna bevel some more of these edge loops to control the shape a bit better and i'll just play around with this until it looks halfway decent again it doesn't have to look exactly like the real thing as long as it looks pretty good you're gonna be fine we're going to make this part a little bit thicker just because i think that looks pretty good and once we got the rough shape down here around the nose and all this shit back here we're gonna have to take care of this black area so the problem is that has to start back here behind this little bar that goes all the way around and it has to be shaped kind of like this and to do that first of all we're gonna have to mark an edge loop on the inside of this bar here this is what separates this gray surface from this white part Control e mark seam then in face select mode we can select this and p to separate it to new object once we got that out of the way we can easily select some geometry like this select everything on the inside of that towards the middle with a brush select tool it might be wise to also separate this area with some seams so we can select it more easily select these two edge loops in the back like this extrude them backwards don't worry we're gonna get rid of this in a moment now select this surface and deselect this new extruded part inset that and press b to uncheck boundary in the inset properties and that gives us some geometry which allows us to create this type of shape now you can get rid of this and just slide this geometry inwards to get the shape that we're looking for so one by one we're gonna slide these vertices to give us the rough shape here and i don't want to have this super stretched out face so i'm gonna add a loop cut slide this to the end maybe another loop cut over here so we can get rid of this now the geometry is a little bit less stretched out let's also do that on the outside i'm gonna change to a lighter matte cap because this blue is getting painful to look at but once we got this geometry going well for us over here, we're going to select these edge loops. With Control b we're going to bevel them to turn them into two edge loops, then extrude them inwards one by one to create this gap here. Once we got that gap, we can go back to subdivision surface. As you can see, now we got a clear divide between these two surfaces, which makes it very easy to apply different materials to them. You might have some twisting over here, which we got to take care of with some extra supporting loops. I'm going to select these, and now I think this looks quite good. Now that this is taken care of, let's move over to the headband. I've noticed that the headband is attached to the visor here through a hole right here. Now that hole's got to be perfectly straight. So here's how I'm going to cut that hole. I'm going to press Control 1 to go to rear view. And we need a straight hole, but this geometry is kind of curved. So that's going to be pretty hard to do. But if we just take a vertex from somewhere over here, extrude it and pull it down on the Z axis. As we're pulling it down, eventually it's going to get to another vertex, which is exactly on the other side down here. And as you can see, it doesn't cut through any vertical edges. It only cuts through horizontal edges, which means we can use a 
knife tool down here, press Z to limit that to the Z axis and bring it up here to this vertex, hit enter. And now we got a straight cut right here. We're also going to do that for this vertex right here. So K for knife tool, click right here and Z to limit it to the Z axis, then bring it down here, click and hit enter. Now we can delete all this geometry in between. And we just got to figure out a way to give this a nicer shape. We're going to make one vertical knife cut over here up to this edge and one horizontal knife cut right here to this edge. Now we can slide this geometry up to this vertex and then it's going to be a straight line up here. Get rid of this. And we're going to do the same shit down here. And then we can just slide these vertices up to make a nice curve down here. And we're going to slide these down to make a curve up here. Before you know it, we got a beautiful cut. We're going to extrude right click and push that inwards into the body of this object. As always, we're going to bevel this slightly. And it looks like this geometry up here is giving me some artifacts. So I'm going to take this edge loop, slide it inwards, merge by distance. And that looks wonderful. Of course, we're going to have to copy this to the other side, but I'm not sure exactly which geometry to delete. So I'm going to mark these edge loops as seams, select those two edge loops, shift D, right click SX minus one across the 3D cursor here in the middle. Now we know what we got to delete on the other side. So we're going to select everything in between, delete that. And now we can take this segment, shift D, right click SX minus one, correct the normals, merge by distance, get rid of the seams, and we're good to go. Now we can start adding the headband. It turns out this hole here is way too thin. So I'm just going to improvise and I'm going to make my own version, which is going to have a little thinner segment over here that can connect to this tiny hole. It's stupid, I know, but I don't feel like redoing it. You can do it better than me, probably. So now we're going to take the geometry from this outline, shift D, right click, P to separate that to new object. Now extrude, right click, scale it to zero on the Y axis and push it outwards a little bit like this. Then extrude, right click, scale this up, select this segment over here, press I to inset. And when you inset it, check outset, make sure the edge rail is not checked, make sure the even offset is checked. We're going to increase this thickness and this is going to make the headband wider around here. Get rid of this. We can even lift this up a little bit further and we can drop this down a little bit further. And now this gives us a good shape for the rest of this headband here. We're going to extrude that out to here, then extrude it again over to the other side so we can make this bump in a second and then bring it to the back, but not to the end because we still got to make this into a curve here. Then give me a loop cut, bevel it to turn into two loop cuts. Take this lower section and lower it down a little bit like this. Move this geometry inwards a little bit. Also on this side, before we start adding more geometry to tighten up these corners, we're going to have to create this curve over here. So place the 3D cursor between the extremities over here. Take this little section, give me Alt E spin, set the angle to 180 and let's try eight steps. Make sure that this is connected down here and we're just going to try manually filling in this surface to see if it works out. We're going to have to get rid of some of these inner edge loops so we can take all of these X dissolve edges and then just replace that with a single loop cut and fill that. Now we're going to add some supporting geometry to control this shape a little bit better. I want three loop cuts right here. Some more loop cuts over here on the sides. We're going to bring those closer together and we're going to try to adjust this curve so it matches the reference image in the back. Now we're going to select these edge loops in the back here and bevel them like this. Select this edge loop, deselect this stuff on the inside, slide this up a little bit to tighten up this corner. I want to do the same thing down here. Object shade smooth and now we just got to add some of the details to this part. Out here we got whatever this is. To make that I'm going to take some geometry from over here. Shift D, right click, separate that to new object. We're going to delete the top half. Then I'll duplicate the lower half, rotate by 180 degrees around the X axis while the 3D cursor is over here. Merge by distance. Get rid of this. Inset this a little bit and delete the outline. Now extrude this outwards. In vertex select mode, press control I, delete the face in the back. Bring this a little closer together. We're going to take this surface in the front and inset that. Get this under control by scaling it down. Adjust this shape a little bit. Maybe another loop cut which we can pull out. Maybe we can make this whole thing a little bit thicker. And then we got this little black area down here. So we're going to apply the subdivision surface modifier. Give me a little surface like this. Inset, slide this down like this and slide this back like this. Inset this area slightly again. Take this tiny face loop in the middle and shoot it inwards. Again, give me a subdivision surface modifier. Select all the sharp corners here. Bevel that with control B. And now we can apply a separate material right here. And now we're just going to add a simple cylinder back here to make whatever the hell this is. So give me 16 vertices. Scale that down rotate it give me a loop cut so that we can make an extra little gap here in the back delete this bevel this control one for subdivision surface inset this one more time fill this back inset it slightly delete the face one more loop cut right here object shade smooth and these little dots here we can make with texture maps or emission maps 
Now on the inside of this shape, we have something else which we can see on the other side and I'm guessing it's the same shit on both sides. We're gonna lift this up so we can see it better. This has to have the same shape on both sides. So we're gonna delete the vertices at the top. Give me this area, shift the right click S minus one on the Z axis. We gotta scale this down, otherwise it ain't gonna fit. And then we just gotta connect everything. Select this surface, I to inset O for outset. We just need a little gap right here that we can extrude inwards. Again, select all the sharp edges like this. Control B to bevel. And now we got this shape too. Let's join all this into the same object. Shift D and mirror to the other side of the 3D cursor. And we're almost there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm slowly losing my mind from modeling, but the show must go on. Now the headband should be quite easy. We're going to start by adding a plane around here somewhere. And this plane should be slightly larger than this thing in the back here. Then from side view, we just have to extrude this backwards like this. Scale it up back here. Give me some more geometry. With W, I'm going to subdivide this. And I want two cuts. Then Control 2 for a subdivision surface modifier. Place the 3D cursor over here. Select all of this. And we're going to scale this up on the Y axis to give it a curve. And we're going to slide this a little bit to soften this part. We probably shouldn't have added all this geometry yet we should have first turned this into like a u shape so let's get rid of all these edge loops mirror this over to the other side select these two and go bridge edge loops and now we can bevel this a little bit it's probably supposed to be wider around the head so we're going to scale this up on the x-axis a little bit give me some more geometry just so we have square tiles then select this entire surface deselect the vertical edge loops like this once we got only horizontal edge loops remaining go to loop tools space loop tools relax i'm going to go with 10 iterations and now we just got to make this a little bit thicker and we also got to add these details around here so first of all extrude right click alt s to add some thickness then select the face loop that goes all the way around press i to inset but then press o for outset and that's going to create this edge around here so we can select that new geometry which we just created Control b to bevel that we're going to turn it into three edge loops then select the middle edge loops and with alt s we're going to push them inwards a little bit that's going to create this little band that goes around here and now we're going to select a little area over here, inset that. Let's go loop tool circle, but I don't want to turn this into circle. I just want to make the geometry more even on all sides. So we're going to scale this up, scale these edges up on individual origins. Now we can extrude that inwards a little bit like this. And that's going to allow us to create this little metal piece here. Then we're going to inset another little part over here. Give me a circle with eight vertices and rotate that sideways. Take the lower half, we're going to bring that down here. Bridge edge loops to connect it with the surrounding geometry. Connect this and connect this. It looks like we're going to need some supporting geometry but i don't want this loop cut to go all the way around this object so i'm just going to select all this separate this to new object and then it's a little bit easier for me to add some supporting geometry without affecting everything else we also need to make a hole back here where we're going to place this little orange piece select all the horizontal edges on this inset area with individual origin scale into zero on the z-axis to straighten them out then take the vertical ones and with individual origin scale into zero on the y-axis to straighten them out bring this closer together delete this now extrude this inwards a little bit bevel this part and we can very easily create this orange piece by just using a little plane rotating that sideways give me some subdivision surface from top view we're going to extrude this towards the back like this and like this and like this then give me a u-turn and let's start coming back and this is more or less the shape that we're going for extrude right click alt s to to give some thickness maybe a supporting edge loop like this and we're going to join all this into the same object delete one half of this entire headband copy everything and bring it to the other side now it's completely symmetrical and we can get rid of this edge loop finally we gotta do these bars back here and this should be pretty simple provided that our geometry is quite consistent so we're going to select this entire surface in the back here shift d separate that to a new object apply one level of subdivision surface mark creases around all the edges here apply two levels of subdivision surface and now select all the vertical edges Edge segments like this one by one make sure that they all have an even length by going to loop tools space then go x delete edges and remaining are only some edge loops which are vertical and they're exactly following the curvature of the back of this headset we're going to select the ends at the top with double g we're going to slide them down just slightly we're going to do the same thing down here at the bottom to bring these up a little bit from top view we're going to duplicate this and with alt s we're going to bring them all to the inside of the headband now go to object convert to curve and then this is no longer an object it's now a curve right so we can change the curve properties go to geometry increase the depth make sure to check fill caps and just set the depth to whatever looks best don't worry we are going to bevel these endpoints here i think something like 0.045 works pretty well in this case once that's done we're gonna go back to object convert to mesh it turns out that the caps here are all fucked up so we gotta undo this uncheck fill caps then go object convert to mesh and we're going to manually select all the endpoints with our brush tool with c f to fill them all individually i want the same 
same thing at the bottom. Make sure that all the caps are filled. Then select one of them, Shift G, select similar area. Reduce the threshold to something like 0.0001. And with Control B, we're gonna bevel each of those caps. Press C to clamp overlap. Shape's gotta be 0.5. And give me something like three segments. Select everything, merge by distance. You can add some subdivision surface if you want to. And now go to Object, Shade Smooth. And I think that looks pretty good. We just need to make this little orange band on the outside. To do that, we're going to select a surface like this and this surface down here. Duplicate that and separate it to new object. We're going to add a loop cut where we want this orange thing to be. Delete the rest of the geometry around this loop cut. Same thing down here at the bottom. Shorten this to make sure it doesn't stick out here. And now we're just going to do the same thing. Apply the subdivision surface modifier. Then go object, convert, curve. And in the curve properties, we're once again going to add a little bit of depth. This one's got to be a little bit thinner. So I think something like 0.016 is going to do. Turns out 0.02 works better. Object convert to mesh object shade smooth and the modeling is now finally complete so we can move on to the texturing Let's talk about how we're gonna texture this thing. I can really only see one kind of texture here which we have to download. And I'm talking about this fabric texture over here. Now this type of texture is surprisingly difficult to find online. But I like to get my textures from Ambient CG. You can press this button called Explore All PBR Materials. And I typed in fabric which eventually led me to this texture right here. It's not exactly the same as what I'm looking for but it's close enough. Don't worry about the color, we can change that. We're gonna download this in 2K and we're also gonna download some kind of backup texture maybe this one right here and then in blender we have to first create the basic materials so let's go to material view first of all give me a new material for the glass in the front that's got to be dark blue make it completely reflective give me metallic and i think that looks pretty cool now for the frame around this we're going to add a new material which we're going to name metal crank up the metallic value reduce the roughness but i can see that it's almost like it has some kind of texture here and we can create this texture with a roughness map so shift a noise texture node plug that into roughness with Control T, we're going to add these two nodes. And this is only going to work if you have your Node Wrangler add-on enabled. You can go to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, check Node Wrangler right here. And now when you press Control T on any node, it's going to give you these two nodes for mapping the texture more easily. Plug the object into Vector back here. Increase the scale. And I also want a Color Ramp node between the Noise Texture and the Principal node. This is going to allow me to control the gradient between the colors. So we're going to reduce the roughness. And we can then make this texture look like the spotted thing that we can see in the reference image. Play around with this a little bit to see what gives you the best result. I think this looks pretty good right now. We're going to apply the same material to these buttons over here so select both the buttons then select the frame press ctrl l link materials this knob has to have a different material at the top here so we're going to select the surface at the top ctrl plus a couple of times then in the material properties tab add a new material assign into this surface and you can give that whatever properties you want i'm going to make mine gray like this and then i want a simple black material for these grills i'm also going to mark some edge loops around the bottom of these holes here when i select them i'm going to mark them as seams this allows me to very easily select the surface at the bottom with l in face select mode now i'm going to create a new material and assign it there this has to be completely black with zero specularity so it looks like it's just dark in there these blades are going to be metallic and now we're going to move down here to the camera first of all we need a glass material for the cover so crank up transmission reduce the roughness to almost zero and then cycles we're going to be able to see through this so let's lower this down on the lens i want to apply the same material which i added to the front to the visor that's this material over here which we're going to name visor assign that and we're going to add some simple materials around this camera such as some kind of a simple gray over here i want the inside to be black so let's try the black metal that looks pretty good this should probably be a little bit darker like this and then over here we're going to apply the black metal as well make sure that you got the same thing going on, on the other camera as well and over here we still got to add the holes but we're going to take care of that in a minute let's move to the fabric part back here this is going to be called fabric one we're going to drag and drop these images into this material here even though we don't want this to be green we're still going to plug the color into color we're just going to add a hue saturation though and place it over here set the saturation to zero and now we still get the details from this texture but not the colors now let's pull out the normal map run that through a normal map node color space should be non-color plug the color into color normal into normal and of course we're gonna have to uv unwrap this so let's apply the mirror modifier we're going to mark our seams around here somewhere because we don't want them to be very visible and now with Control t we're gonna add a node wrangler so that we can increase the scale here a scale of five seems to work quite well and finally we're gonna set up the roughness map that's gonna be non-color as well 
plug it into roughness and we're good to go. Make sure to adjust the scale for all the other textures as well. And even though it doesn't make any sense, this texture looks a lot better when it's metallic. So we're gonna see how that plays out when we render it. And now on the inside, we got some kind of black fabric here and a very soft gray fabric over here. This is the part that touches your face. I feel like we might be able to get away with just creating simple materials with no texture here. So let's select this and add a new simple black material. Increase the roughness and reduce the specularity of that material. I really don't feel like downloading anything, so let's try a noise texture. Give me a bump node, plug the color into height and the normal into normal, crank up the scale, reduce the strength, increase the roughness and increase the detail in the noise texture node. We can even make this look kind of leathery and I think that looks pretty damn cool. Then for the band here, give me a simple gray material, copy the same noise texture bump setup into this material. We're gonna make this a lot softer and smoother. Something like this looks pretty good. Now back here, give me a very simple white material, which is gonna be the plastic that is attached over here in the front. Over here, I feel the need to create a metallic material. Maybe we can use the same metal material which we use in the front over here. We're gonna select this and also this over here on the other side. Press Control plus a couple of times, add a new material, assign it there, and this is going to be the visor. This little cap over here can also carry the metal material from the front. And then back here, of course, we're also going to apply the fabric. But first, we gotta UV unwrap this. We're gonna duplicate this material because I wanted to have more details. We're gonna name this fabric band, and we're just gonna increase the scale to something like eight instead of five. Also apply that over here to these bars. We can unwrap this with the smart unwrap tool. And then on these little things, we're also going to load up the fabric and we're gonna duplicate it one more time. We're going to name this fabric orange. And this is where the hue saturation tool is gonna be useful because we're gonna bring back the saturation, set that to one, then change the hue until this becomes orange. We're also gonna make a separate material for this band that goes around the headband. We're gonna name that band band. That's gonna be a little bit darker. Then over here, we're also going to apply the orange fabric and this little bit of course has to have some kind of metallic material so we can once again just apply the same metal that we use for everything else and before you know it, we got all the basic materials down now we just have to bake the little details such as these holes over here or these dots or whatever else Let's count how many holes we have down here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 holes in the middle line, and then one less up here and down here, so 10 on the top and the bottom lines. So let's pull up to the side somewhere. Give me a circle with, let's say, eight vertices, fill, inset, extrude downwards like this, scale the lower part down just a little bit, delete the face in the middle, create a tiny bevel on this edge right here. Now give me subdivision surface, object, shade smooth, and then we gotta use an array modifier to make all these other copies of this little circle. So add modifier, array, we're gonna set the factor to something like 1.3, that looks about right. Set the count to 11, then duplicate this, place it exactly in between two circles like this, and lift it up. This row has to have only 10 copies, and then we're gonna use our 3D cursor to also copy this over to the other side. Apply all the modifiers and all these objects here. Join them all into the same object and now add a plane and place that plane just above this surface. Before we continue, make sure to check your normals on this by checking face orientation over here. Everything should be blue. If it ain't, press shift and to correct the normals. Bring this back, scale the plane up so that these holes fit inside the plane. And we're gonna need a new material for this called the normal map. Give me an image texture node, generate a new image. We're gonna set the resolution to something pretty high. Let's do 4096 by 4096. I don't want anything grainy when I'm making this normal map. And this is going to be called Holes Normal Map. Check 32-bit float. Click OK. Color space got to be non-color. You can view that image right here by searching for it. Then select the holes and shift select the plane. Make sure that you're in cycles and in the render properties, you got to scroll down to bake. Bake type normal. Select it to active. Make sure that the node here is selected and reduce the number of samples to something low because it's going to take an unnecessarily long time if you have high samples. I don't know why having high samples makes your normal map bake a lot slower. It doesn't affect the result at all. So just set it to the lowest possible value. Anyway, then hit bake and go browse TikToks for a minute because we all know that's the best way to spend your spare time. Maybe I should go get a fucking haircut in my spare time. Eventually, we're going to get a normal map with these holes right here. And it might help you to reduce the margin to something very low because otherwise your shape might get distorted like mine did right here. So we're going to bake this again and then spend a few more minutes contemplating life. Have you ever wondered if you're doing any good in the world or if you're just wasting your time or everybody else's time? Anyway, let's save this normal map with this little menu over here. Go to image 
save as save this image to the computer and now since i'm in a good mood i'm gonna spend some more time explaining what i'm about to do we're about to take this normal map and apply it to this part of the surface which is gonna make it look like there are holes but the holes aren't actually gonna be there the problem is that if we just apply the normal map it's just gonna look like there's little circles cut out from over here and it's not gonna look like deep dark holes as you can see over here the holes are supposed to be black so we have to first of all make a texture which is going to turn these holes black and then on top of that we have to make a special texture map which is gonna tell blender that the bottom of these holes should not reflect any light if it's reflecting any light it's not going to look good at all in other words we're going to create what's called a specularity map which means that this part of the texture map is going to have zero specularity but then we also got to make a metallic map which is going to make sure that the metallic value on these holes is zero otherwise a specular map isn't going to do anything i know there's probably a better way to do it than the way i'm about to show you but i'm going to do it anyway it's like when old people refuse to use atms there's no combination of words that you can tell them to make them use the fucking atm i'm going to open up this normal map and paint net i'll do duplicate it and then i'll use my magic wand tool to select all the flat areas invert my selection so that i only have these circles selected and add the outside area to the selection now once again i'll invert the selection give me a black bucket tolerance 100 shift click to turn all the holes black invert the selection one more time and delete everything else add a new layer below the black holes that new layer has to have the color of this metallic frame over here and that color hex code is e7 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 we're going to copy that bring it into paint as a secondary color and apply that to the background now this is the color map also going to duplicate this to new layer and that new layer is going to determine the specularity now in here there's supposed to be no specularity black means zero value so that should be fine we can always make this environment darker to reduce the specularity in blender if this is too bright and we're also going to need a metal map this is supposed to be non-metallic so we probably don't need a separate image we can use the same image for the specular map and the metallic map so first save this once as the holes color map then save it again as the holes specular map to apply these textures we're going to select a surface down here add a new material slot and load in the metal material make a copy of that metal material we're going to name this holes and in that new material we're going to keep all the same settings except we're going to add an image texture node where we're going to load the color map so holes color map right here plug that into base color and we're going to uv unwrap this surface make sure to assign this material to this area and now your uv map is going to dictate how these holes are going to appear on this surface so we're going to scale that up a little bit like this so that all the holes can fit here we don't even have any distortion so i think this turned out pretty good we can always make this a little bit straighter by taking some of the horizontal edge loops and in the uv map we're going to set the pivot point to individual origins and scale the selected part to zero on the y-axis now we're going to pull out the holes normal map give me a normal map node plug the color into color and the normal into normal as you can see now we got a little bit of 3d effect on this next give me the specular map we're going to set that to non-color as well and plug that into the specular slider it looks like we perfectly nailed the color because all the specularity seems to match perfectly i don't think we're even gonna have to use a metallic map because i don't think it's gonna make any difference at all as you can see here the holes are completely black which is perfect now we just gotta figure out a way to bring this on the other side i'm thinking we can just try to select the surface behind this one like this we can mark seams to remember which area is selected at the moment then select the faces in the back like this and like this that selects the same surface on the other side where we're also going to apply the holes material you unwrap maybe we can even just delete this and duplicate it from the other side so place a 3d cursor in the middle select this area shift the and mirror it across the 3d cursor merge by distance and that looks absolutely wonderful doesn't it let's just quickly fill the inside here so let's extrude this right click and give me alt s to deflate it i just want to have some kind of a frame here maybe we can slightly bevel this extrude this part inwards also bevel this and the surrounding edges now over here we can add some kind of black material maybe just a simple black which is quite shiny is going to work so it looks like plastic which it probably is also this inside part probably shouldn't be fabric we're gonna assign the same plastic material to this surface as well i don't know if that would be possible but maybe we can also try to grid fill this it looks absolutely ridiculous so i would rather just place something there instead so maybe we can just use a simple plane place it back here and then we can just use proportional editing to curve this a little bit Maybe we can do some subdivision surface and now we just need a simple material for this if it's a screen that means it's supposed to be completely reflective like this and i can live with how this looks on the inside next we're going to figure out a way to animate this.
Now I'm gonna show you how I made these three animations right here. If you take what I'm about to show you, you can render pretty much anything with basically the same style. Any product on earth is gonna look cool if you present it like this. So I'm giving you the exact fucking blueprint that all these 3D artists use when they visualize products, when they sell it to companies for some money. This is exactly what everybody's doing except you. That's why you're not making any money. So pay attention because this is probably the most important part of this video. Here's what our product looks like to begin with. We're not even gonna use cycles this time. We're just gonna use EV. And the first thing we have to do is pull up an environment texture right now there's no lights in the scene there's only the environment which is casting light onto this object so here's how you do that that's step number one go to google and search for polyhaven click on hdris and now you got a whole bunch of environment textures right here go up here to the search box and type in royal and you're going to find this environment texture called royal esplanade 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 is that how do you pronounce this thing i have no fucking idea but i'm not trying to be a linguist i'm here to show you how to do blender so don't worry about it click on this download button right here and now you got your EXR image saved in your downloads folder. So go to Blender, go to the shading workspace, switch from object to world over here, select this background node which controls the color of your background. And if you go to rendered view now, you can see that this background node controls the color of your environment. So we're gonna select this and press Control T to add a node wrangler. This gives us an environment texture node where we can load this EXR image which we just downloaded. So in your downloads folder, search for Royal Esplanade EXR and that's going to load it into your scene. You will also notice that I got a transparent background. That's because I went over here to render properties, find the film menu and check transparent. And in this case, the only reason I really want an environment texture is so that I can have some cool reflections in this visor. So I'm going to set my strength to 0.1 just so there's something going on in the reflections. I want to create artificial lights myself in Blender. So when you're doing this type of shit, you gotta sit here for a couple minutes and think about what you think would look cool as an animation for this product. Luckily, I'm a genius, so it only took me about a minute to come up with something that I think would look cool. And you can do the same shit or try to do a variation of the same thing. I'll place my 3D cursor in the middle of the world and that's where I'm going to add an area light. I'll scale this area light down to like 0.7, move it over here to the front and lift it up above the scene. If we bring it closer, you can see the reflection over here and I want mine to be a little bit stronger. So I'm gonna crank it up to something like 65. Then we're going to duplicate this G, X and hold control to snap it over here to the side. And we're going to copy it a whole bunch of times so that we have a whole array of lights above the scene. Now keep in mind, even though you're using EV, this is gonna heavily slow down your scene. But if you wanna get a good result, it's gonna take some time to render. It's like if we're trying to look cute because you're going on a date or if we're trying to get ripped It takes some fucking effort to prepare this anyway lift this above your scene and now in render view You can see how these lights are reflecting from up here So we're going to make an animation where they start way up there and then they're slowly coming down like this and watch the reflections right here Because of the curvature of the visor they're kind of bending and they're coming down into the scene and it looks really cool It's going to look even cooler if you use your individual origins to make these lights smaller And if you want to simultaneously change some properties on all these lights you can select them all then hold Hold down alt while you're controlling for example the power property and that's going to apply the same change to all of them you can also select all except one then shift select the last one press ctrl l link object data now any changes that you make to this one for example if you change the color on this one on the end here all the lights are going to copy the same properties so maybe you want to make these slightly yellow slightly warm so they look more like the scene around them maybe you want to make them slightly blue figure it out i'm just going to keep mine white and now we got to make an animation where they start up here and they come all the way down here so let's place them down here first i want them to come only about this close i don't want them to be no closer so here's how you make that animation go to the animation workspace place your 3d cursor over here and go to shift a empty cube scale this cube or stretch it out or do whatever you got to do so that all the lights fit inside that cube now select all the lights shift select the cube control p and parent these objects to the cube now you just have to move the cube if you want to move all of them so we said we want the animation to finish over here so let's say on frame 110 we want these lights to be here which means we're going to move this mark to this point frame 113 or whatever the last point is you can control how long your animation is going to be down here keep in mind that this is determined by the frame rate by default your frame rate is 24 which means you have to divide this by 24 and that's how long your animation is going to be since i'm going to be combining this animation with 30 fps video i set my frame rate to 30 in this output properties tab you can set it to whatever the fuck you want you can even do custom i recommend you go to 30 because it's going to look cleaner but it's also going to take more time to render so in this case 120 divided by 30 equals four seconds that's how long this animation is going to be. Anyway, we're going to move over here to the last frame and select this box which carries all the lights 
press I and keyframe the location and rotation. Now we're telling Blender to remember that at this point in time, we want this object to be exactly here. We set the location and the rotation of this object at this point in time. Those are the two properties which Blender remembered. It doesn't care about the scale. It doesn't care about any of these other properties that you have over here. I don't even know what those are to be quite honest with you. Anyway, now the last frame or the last position is over here. So we can move over to the beginning and at the beginning, we're going to lift this up further above the scene. We don't want to move them too far because they're not going to be visible. So we're going to bring them to somewhere around here. And this is where the animation is going to begin. So again, press I keyframe location rotation. And if you look over here now, you can play your animation and you're going to see how these lights are starting to move downwards. All right. Right now we have a smooth transition between the keyframes, which means that the object starts up here, then it accelerates, it gets up to speed and then it starts to slow down to get to the final point. I don't want this. I want it to be a constant motion. So I'm going to select these two keyframes with A. You can also use your box select tool and press T, set the interpolation to linear. By default, it's set to this one down here that I'm not going to try to pronounce. Now you can see it's a constant motion, which makes it appear like it's a little bit faster, even though the average speed is the same. If you want to be extra, you can even move these forwards a little bit to add some more movement to this animation. But anyway, I also want some lights coming from below because that's going to look even cooler. So take all of this, duplicate it with Shift D, right click, rotate by 180 degrees around the X axis and lower it down below the scene. You can change the position or the rotation of these lights if you prefer that. And I'm going to deselect the box. So I only have these lights selected. And with my individual origins, I'm going to make these lights noticeably bigger. We're going to place them somewhere around here. And we're going to do a similar animation except from down below, which is going to make these lights slowly appear into the scene. And I think that's going to look pretty damn good. So my camera is going to be over here in the front, which means the lights can start somewhere around here. Maybe we'll bring them a little bit closer to the surface. So the final position will be around here somewhere. And again, you can tweak the brightness or the size or the color or the position. You can tweak whatever you want. This is just how I'm doing it to show you guys how this shit works. Press I, keyframe location rotation, then go back to the first frame and lower it way down here somewhere. And again, keyframe location rotation. Select the keyframes, interpolation linear with T. And now this is what our animation is going to look like. Keep in mind that this is very slow because it's taking some time to render. When you render, this is going to be much faster. Now you can add even more lights to add some cooler reflections. You can add some colored lights to the sides. You can do whatever you want. Try to follow the same principle where lights are appearing into the scene. I'm also going to add a plane, which I'm going to to rotate sideways, place that in the background like this and make it really big. Go to front view with one, then add a camera if you don't have one and press control alt zero to align the camera with your view. You can press G to move the camera and then double Z to move it further or closer on its local Z axis. I'm going to move it around here somewhere and I'm also going to increase the focal length in the camera properties. This plane and the background has to be black and then we're going to add an area light over here next to this plane. Rotate that sideways like this. We're going to move it around here somewhere so it's next to the plane increase the power to whatever the reflections of the light in this plane in the background are heavily dependent on the properties of the material which is applied to this plane so you can control the roughness you can control the specularity you can even make this metallic if you want to you can change the color to anything that you like figure it out come up with something that you think looks cool there's no right or wrong way to do this and as usual I want my scene to start off dark so I'm going to move this light back on its local Z axis like this that's going to be frame zero so again place the marker over here select this light press i to keyframe location and rotation so this is the starting position and then later on in the scene somewhere around here i'm going to move this closer on its local z axis so that it's casting more light onto the background like this now again go i keyframe location rotation select the keyframes interpolation linear and this is what it looks like now and now when we play this animation the light slowly appears in the scene again this is going to be faster when we render it now it's taking forever because i'm recording it i'm in viewport render shit's slow at the moment i'm going to duplicate this light because I also want to have the same thing going on on the other side over here but make sure that when you copy this you delete the keyframes that you had from before because otherwise as soon as you play the animation this one over here is just gonna snap to the location of the old one because that's where it's keyframed anyway keyframe this again the same way we keyframe the other one bring it a little bit closer over here and now we have a pretty cool lighting situation going on here I'm going to select my camera and I want it to start quite close like this so to do that I'm going to set the focal length to something like 73 that has to be frame zero so click on this button to keyframe this setting on frame zero then move over to the final frame and on the final frame I want this to be a little bit further out so I'm going to reduce the focal length to something like 55 keyframe that again again set the interpolation to linear make sure to adjust the size of the plane if you have to because we don't want to see no edges here and now it's slowly going to be zooming out as these lights are appearing and that's going to look cool as fuck that's animation number one let me show you animation number two 
I'm going to keep more or less the same lighting for animation number two, except in animation number two, I want my camera to start over here and slowly move to underneath here. So to do that, we're going to have to have an object in the middle of the headset around which the camera is going to pivot. If you want the camera to rotate around something, you can't animate the camera. It's going to look like a mess. So place the 3D cursor over here. I'm going to add a new empty called arrows, select the camera, shift, select this, control P, parent this. And now when you rotate this, the camera is going to move along with it. Now, when you go to camera view and if you select this, you can see what the camera is seeing as you rotate this object. You can always change the relative position of the camera as well. I want my animation to start around here somewhere. That's going to be frame zero. So select this parent object, I keyframe location rotation, then move on to the final keyframe. And that's going to be from further down here. Again, keyframe location rotation, linear interpolation. And I'm going to delete the keyframes for the zooming shit. So I want my camera to be a lot closer for this animation. The purpose of this animation is to show the details from underneath this headset. So maybe we'll make the lower position even lower to some Something like this. I want this animation to be quite slow, so I'm going to stretch these keyframes further apart. This is what the animation looks like. Keep in mind that right now the lighting is more or less the same shit as before. We have to fix the background because we have to have a ceiling for this animation. So we can just push this way back so it's not visible at all on this scene. And we're going to extrude the top edge and bring it forward so that we have a ceiling like this. Now check the animation to make sure that at no point you're sticking out of this ceiling. And using the same background lighting method that I just showed you a couple minutes ago, I'm going to animate a light up here on the ceiling. Ceiling. So I want to start with a dark scene. So this is where my light is starting out. As you can see, it's producing some light, which is visible on the ceiling in the background. In the final position, I want that to be something like this. So we're going to keyframe the location of the light, also going to keyframe the power. Then on frame zero, I'm going to reduce the power to something very low and keyframe that there. Now, as we roll the animation, the light is slowly going to appear in the background. Again, this is going to be faster than the preview we can see right here. I also want these lights to move from side to side. I don't just want them to appear like this. So I'm going to make their starting position somewhere out here, keyframe that to overwrite the old keyframe here. And now they're going to come in like this, which is going to make these reflections move more. I also don't want these lights to be as powerful because I'm trying to showcase this area right here. On top of that, here's the coolest thing that I like to add to animations from time to time. I want to make this blurry at first, but then the camera starts to focus on the object better. So select the camera, go to the camera properties over here, check depth of field. And now there's going to be a little bit of blur on the objects which are outside of the focus area. You can control the focus distance. Obviously, if the object you want to focus on is nine meters away from the camera, that's the distance you want to set here. You can slide this to figure out when the right area is in focus. In this case, for me, it's something like 15 meters and anything which is further or closer than that is going to be blurry. How blurry it's going to be, you can control by reducing the f-stop. If you reduce the f-stop to the minimum value, everything which is not exactly on the focal distance is going to be extremely blurry. You can also keyframe both of these properties. So we're going to start with everything being quite blurry like this, that's going to be on keyframe zero. So keyframe both of those properties while your marker is on the first frame. Then as you move forward approximately halfway through the animation, I want everything to be well in focus here. So while my f-stop value is still low, I'm going to move my focal distance to these details down here, keyframe that, again set the interpolation to linear, and I'm also going to increase the f-stop to make the other stuff a little bit less blurry so it's not so extreme. Now as you can see, everything comes into focus as the animation progresses. You can slow down this effect by moving these final keyframes frames. Now I'm going to show you the final animation, which is probably the most important for general purposes. This is one of the best ways to showcase any product. To do this, we just need a plane. We're going to place that below the object. It's up to you whether you want this object to be sitting on this surface or whether you want there to be some space. The environment texture does not create any shadows. So we're going to reduce that a little bit to something like 0.03, just so there are still some reflections. But the majority of lighting is going to come from artificial lights, which are going to cast shadows. If we add an area light above the scene and we crank up its power, here you can see the shadows. So I'm going to make a bunch of these lights above the scene, something like this. The more lights you have, the cooler it's going to look because the reflections are going to be more complex. With individual origins, we're going to make these a little bit smaller, maybe scale them all apart a little bit like this. Maybe make one of them light blue, make another one slightly yellowish. I'm going to reduce the roughness of the material on the ground so you can see the light reflecting here. Just keep in mind that your product is not going to reflect in Eevee. If you want reflections on your materials, then you have to go to cycles, which is going to take forever to render. So 
So for me, it's not worth doing this just for these videos. If I was doing this for a serious client, then I would use cycles because then I can render this shit all night if you're paying me big money. Here's an example of just how different this looks when you render it in cycles. Obviously, it's going to be much more realistic, but the lighting works very different. And if you guys want, we can do a tutorial on the differences between cycles and Eevee, when you should use Eevee, when you should use cycles and all this other shit. Anyway, give me a couple more lights in Eevee, which I'm going to place on the side like this. We're going to crank that shit up because I need more light in this scene. Right now, it's way too dark. Place a 3D cursor in the middle of the world. Duplicate this, rotate it, and place it around here somewhere. Give me some more. As you can see, this looks pretty cool now. You can take each one of these lights placed around the scene, press G to move them, and then double Z. This is going to move them along their individual Z axes. You can use this to either bring these lights closer or pull them further apart. You can also duplicate them and lift them up, scale down the copy. And as we said, there's no reflections from materials in Eevee render, so this reflection is way too dark at the moment. Objects are not reflected from materials, but light sources are. So we're going to take one of these area lights and place it over here somewhere in the front. We're going to scale that way up, also increase the power. And if you place a couple of these in the background, they're going to be visible in reflection. So do what you got to do to make this look cool, all right? You might even have to add an area light from underneath, and then that's going to reflect from the visor, which is going to make it look like it's sitting on this white plane. Just keep in mind, this is going to have a serious effect on your shading over here. So be quite cautious when you're doing this. Anyway, I'm just trying to do this quickly for the tutorial because I don't want to sit here for another two hours. But these lights are going to look a lot cooler if you try to arrange them in some kind of shapes. For example, you can try to arrange them in this kind of Windows logo, and that's going to make the reflections look a lot cooler and more detailed. You can make rows of lights like we made earlier, play around with it and figure out something that works well for you. Once we got this lighting rig going on over here, I know it looks ridiculous, but you guys get the fucking point. Now again, we're going to make these lights start up here in the animation workspace. So go to keyframe zero, I keyframe location rotation, then come down here. And also in frame zero, we're going to set the power of these lights to something very low, like 200 maybe. So keyframe that. And when we turn off the lights, we also got to turn off the environment lighting because right now it looks stupid. So go to the shading workspace, set the strength here to zero and then right click to keyframe that. And on frame, let's say 25, we're going to set this to something slightly higher. So we have a reasonable amount of lighting here. So set the value to whatever, right click, insert keyframe. And now at frame zero, there's no environmental lighting. And on frame 25, the scene lights up a little bit. Now we're going to take these lights and lower them down into the scene. And we're also going to increase their power to whatever it was before, probably a couple of thousand. Keyframe that, keyframe the position. And in this animation, I want my camera to spin around the product so it can show the whole thing. So again, give me an empty in the middle of the scene, create a camera. I deleted my old camera. So I'll make a new one. Control Alt Zero to align my camera with the view. I want to showcase this product from the side. And I'm going to animate some rotation like this. So to do that, I'm going to have to create some walls for the scene. And that can very easily be done by just extruding this plane upwards. You can keep it like this if you want to, but I'm going to make my corners a little bit smoother by beveling them. So Control B on all the geometry, scroll up as much as you can. Object, shade smooth. I'm also going to increase the roughness a little bit and also reduce the specularity because otherwise it's going to look a bit silly. Now in my animation, my camera is going to rotate rotate around this scene. Make sure that you don't get any shit like this in the background. So in this case, we're going to scale this light down and make sure that it doesn't have a sharp edge on the ground like this one does right here. Also going to have to make sure that your room is evenly lit. So if you got to place some more lights over there, go ahead and do that. Anyway, the camera has to be parented to this object over here. We're going to start in the front here, increase my focal length so it looks like we're closer. I even think it's quite cool if my camera is slightly below the object and it's looking up towards the bottom of the object. Anyway, keyframe this empty object to which the camera is parented on frame zero to this location and rotation. Then let's set the end to something like 300. And over there, we're going to rotate this by 360 degrees around the Z-axis. I, keyframe location rotation. Select both the keyframes. T, set the interpolation to linear. And now when you play your animation, this is going to be a continuous loop where the camera is slowly rotating around the scene. And make sure that you play around with your lights. You can always add more lights and animate more lights as the scene is progressing. You can change the colors. You can do whatever the fuck you want to do. I'm, I'm trying to keep this simple so you guys understand how this works. As you can see, there's only a few simple lighting and animation concept that you got to understand to be able to pull off whatever you want. I recommend that you spend at least another hour messing with the lights and the background and all this other shit in the scene and try and figure out what looks best. Take some of the tips that I showed you, put everything together, and in no time you're going to have some really cool animations. Once you get the right setup for whatever products you're modeling in general, you're always going to be able to use more or less the same thing. And at that point, creating new products and animations 
expanding your portfolio, working with new clients becomes easy as hell. And now you gotta export this animation. So go over here to output properties. I like to keep the default resolution 1080p. My frame rate is gonna be 30. Here you can choose your output folder. So find wherever you wanna save this and give it a name. Set the file format to FFmpeg video. Set the container to MPEG4. And that's the one I usually use. Maybe you know something better. Video codec's gotta be H264, that's MP4. Medium output quality and good encoding speed works quite well. And all you have to do is go up here to render, render animation. If you got this many lights, even this might take some time. These animations took me around 20 minutes to render. Now guys, I tried to speed run this animation section here, but if you want a more thorough explanation, then let me know in the comments. I can make a whole nother video where I'm gonna properly break down animation. I'm gonna show you all the little beginner details and we won't have to summarize everything into only a few short minutes. A lot of you beginners tell me in the comments that I move way too fast. You're watching a YouTube video. Just roll back a couple of seconds, pause it at any time and just check what I'm pressing and which menu I'm opening. I try to mention everything that I click on. You can always just Google this shit or ask me in the comments, Aryan, what is this at this point in time? I wouldn't get anywhere if I explained every single smallest detail because then these videos would take six hours, nobody would watch them, and then Aryan's not gonna get paid. This is why I write books and ebooks because you can read those at your own pace. Right now, the ebook's all about modeling. Everything I use is in there. I got a texturing update coming for you soon, and in the future, I'm also gonna add an animation update where you're gonna see all this shit broken down thoroughly. If you need some extra help, go to my Patreon page. I can help you out by giving you some tips over Discord. We can have a chat about your projects. You can also download these models that I make in these videos for my Patreon page. So go check that out. Let me know what you guys want to see next and I'm going to see you in the next one.